Well, hello, and welcome to The Long Con, the podcast that takes a light-hearted yet informative look at the collapse of Western civilization and the willful destruction of representative democracy. Uh, my name is Paul. I'm your host. I'm still working out my little uh, intro and a lot of other issues. But anyway, welcome back. I say that because hopefully you were here for our last episode when we told you all about the Policy Circle which is a fast-growing women's discussion group funded and run by ideological entrepreneur and Wilmette soccer mom, Sylvie Legere, or Sylvie Legere Ricketts, to use her billionaire oligarch name. So if you didn't listen to episode six, you should really check that out, get up to speed. But now I want to tell you how I came under the gaze of the policy circle and how I faced ominous legal threats from its members, and also how my friend Leslie and I exposed the crazy stealth ops they were running in Wilmette in the early days of the Trump administration. And if you're new to the long con, or not, please know that I am just a dad, okay? So this happened to me in my community, and um, I think it's probably coming to yours as well. So just keep that in mind as you listen to this story. It is a crazy story that I have never told fully, and it illustrates beautifully just how all of these various long cons fit together. They're each like Russian nesting dolls, no pun intended, uh, where one disinformation campaign or long con fits neatly inside the next. So, Seminar Day con fits snugly into the municipal election con we're going to talk about, which fits snugly into the policy circle con, and on and on and on. But first, I have a very special treat for you. Because in the last episode, I told you that policy circle meetings are top secret and they are confidential, and that is true, but there is one, just one, policy circle meeting that you can all attend. We all can, because this is another video from the policy circle website, and it's a great way for us to start off our episode. So this video is three minutes long. I am presenting it to you unedited. So let's tag along with Charlotte an earnest young gal who was invited to a policy circle discussion by one of her work friends. You must be Charlotte. I'm so happy you could join us for our policy circle. Please come in. Thank you. I was so excited to be invited. Okay, first things first. Charlotte, would you like coffee, tea, or wine? A coffee, please. As you know, we formed our policy circle to learn about the impact of public policy on our community and how to become influencers. Tonight, we're talking about economic growth, specifically job creation, which creates opportunities for everyone to better their lives. Okay, newcomers. First, we do a roundtable discussion where each of us shares what we've learned from the brief and how we can influence policymaking in our town and our state. Remember to be respectful so everyone has time to share their thoughts. I'll act as a facilitator, and when everyone is done sharing their initial perspective, I'll be asking questions from the discussion guide that came with the brief. Tessa, our timekeeper, keeps us on track and is allowed to interrupt when someone is too passionate. Let's keep our initial remarks to about one to two minutes. Then we'll open it up. Ahem. <clears throat> Olivia, you only have 15 more seconds to finish this intro. Oh, who will keep a few notes and post a recap on our circle page? Karen? Court stenographer by day, circle stenographer by night. We also have Brianna, Joan, and Eleanor. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you, I'm Charlotte. How are you? Oh, and everyone, this is my friend Charlotte from work. Thanks for having me. This will be so much fun, you will love it. The ladies are great. Hi. Time to start. I learned so much from the brief. It really challenged some assumptions I had. Can you believe it? It takes 32 days in the city for a professional, like a manicurist or a barber, to obtain a permit. It should be easy for people to innovate, start a business, and hire people, not harder. Small businesses are the job creators. Is the government really the problem? What about education? Doesn't that affect economic True. growth? Today, the school where my brother's kids go is a dropout factory. And with no skills, they have no opportunities. Plus, my niece wants to be an engineer, but only 30 and 100 graduates from her high school are... Great point, Brianna. I'm just doing a time check. Okay, everyone. It's time to recap and talk about how we can make a difference. Ooh, I'll coordinate contacting our representatives. I'll track down what policy changes are a part of the legislative agenda for our state. 
Who'd like to track when our representatives are holding town hall meetings? Hard to believe, but it makes a big difference if we show up and ask questions. Can I do that? Of course you can. Be sure to post the information on our circle page so we can all check our schedules. Karen will post a recap of this discussion on our circle page. We are following the year of conversation and we'll talk about creating opportunity in May. Thank you so much for organizing this. I came nervous to discuss, but felt validated. I really learned from reading the brief and from all of you. What a great group of women. Cheers to that. <laughs> All right, so that is from an animated video uh, demonstrating an actual Policy Circle meeting um, from the Policy Circle website. So what'd you think? Did you enjoy the meeting? Here are a couple of my takeaways. First off, I'm glad that snooty lady checked Brianna on time. I thought she would never stop talking about high school dropouts in bad public schools. My second takeaway is that this video uh, both intrigues and kind of frightens me. One of the things that these meetings clearly uh, offer to the women who attend um, is a really strong sense of emotional validation and also a sense of, you know, belonging and community and support. You know, these are all great things, uh, don't get me wrong, but when they're used in a way to potentially manipulate or lead women, um, it becomes a little bit creepy. And in fact, um, in the uh, Policy Circle social media campaigns, uh, they had one that they were putting out about why uh, substantive conversations lead to greater happiness. And they were uh, touting this Psychology Today article, um, and they had a quote that said, uh, human beings are social animals who have a real need to connect with others. Substantive conversation connects, while small talk doesn't. Now, again, I agree with this. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If these women are feeling comfortable in finding their voices, that's great too. The objection I have and the thing that skeeves me out about the whole thing is just how organized these meetings are. So the ladies prep by reading the assigned policy briefs ahead of time, and then the discussions themselves are highly facilitated by a circle leader. Each member shares what the reading meant to them to personalize it, and then the circle leader takes them through a series of leading questions provided by the policy circle uh, to lead them towards a group consensus. And even though these meetings are confidential and covered by NDA, um, I did manage to get my hands on a circle leader discussion guide for the policy brief on healthcare. We'll post it. And uh, also, I saw the recap email one group leader sent out after a circle discussion on immigration. And that email is quite interesting, so I'll read just a bit of it now. Um, subject, recap and next discussion. Hi, all! Exclamation point. Last night at our discussion on immigration, we had complete consensus that Congress needs to pass a comprehensive immigration reform bill. We also agreed on the following points. Then there's a list of four things that they all agreed on ostensibly. And then number five is five. The U.S. should study birthright citizenship and its unintended consequences and even perhaps repeal the amendment. So that's interesting, huh? The email reiterates that they had complete consensus and reviews what specifics everyone there agreed to, including that apparently everyone thinks that the 14th Amendment should be revisited and even perhaps repealed. So do you think there might be any peer pressure involved here? Like, what if you didn't feel complete consensus with the lady hosting you, who also owns Wrigley Field, or your boss, or your colleague, who's instrumental to you getting ahead at work? And you heard what happens at the end of the meeting, too, right? The circle leader recaps by assigning someone to coordinate contacting their local and state representatives, someone to investigate what policy changes are under consideration for their state, and then someone to track down upcoming public meetings and encourage the rest of the ladies to show up and ask questions. So does that sound like a nonpartisan policy discussion or a marshalling of the troops? Well, it sure looked that way here in Wilmette, I can tell you, where we saw a flood of Policy Circle members popping up to comment and ask questions at our usually quiet and friendly K-8 through public school board meetings. Hi, I'm go. Sylvie Léger. I'm uh, Sylvie Léger. My name is Sylvie Léger. I'm a resident of Wilmette. Uh, my name is Beth Feely. Good evening. Beth Feely. Uh, Beth Feely. Beth Feely. I also am a resident of Wilmette. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Jasmina. Jasmina Hauser. Jasmina uh, Hauser. I'm here in Wilmette. My name is Betsy Hart. I'm a proud member of the Wilmette community and grateful for all who serve it. Betsy Hart. I live in Wilmette. 
I'm not Betsy, I'm Kathy Miles from Wilmette who had to leave. So she asked me to um, make a few comments for her very briefly. I got to tell you, these women were like a plague of locusts that descended during 2017. Um, I'm limiting the sound bites here to just the four gals that are public figures, but there were lots more where these came from, trust me. And it all coincided with Trump's inauguration and the attack on Seminar Day. And the first round of questions uh, were actually about social empathy and an equality initiative the school was planning. I just wanted to um, say a few words about the Equity Teams initiative. So I wonder, what do systems of oppression, power, and privilege look like in a school filled with classrooms of youngsters aged 5 through 12? Also, if you can please define the terms equity, inclusivity, and diversity as it relates to our school climate, the Equity Team Initiative, and teaching our kids about empathy, kindness, and compassion. Um, would like to know what kind of resources are being um, paid out to implement this sort of thing, if it is being implemented. I don't know. Okay, great. We'll keep in touch, Ray. <laughs> I just love how Jasmina says, keep in touch, Ray, with a wink to our outgoing superintendent, Ray Lackner. Uh, he retired. He was awesome. But uh, Jasmina, if you remember, is our resident Breitbart contributor. And I do not know her socially, but she's always got this really loose and kind of strangely chummy vibe about her at these public appearances. I think earlier someone was talking about white privilege and my family and I were at um, dinner one night and we were talking about this whole white privilege thing. And I realized um, I'm first generation Hispanic. My parents immigrated here from a third world country in South America. Oh, and what third world country are your parents from, Jasmina? She never says, because it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but now we get to Sylvie Legere, who ambles up to inquire about the specific costs of empathy initiatives. I'm wondering, as you are presenting the different programs, if you could associate the resources that are assigned to researching and developing the program and the, the costs in terms of time and effort. So... And it would, it would be great to really uh, be transparent about the cost of these uh, initiatives. Okay, this interests me for a couple of reasons. First off, Sylvie Legere is calling for transparency, which, of course, we've demonstrated is a hallmark of everything the policy circle does. She notes the very real value of time spent on these various initiatives, which, of course, she's quite familiar with, because she's getting hundreds of free volunteer hours out of the ladies in the policy circle. But Sylvie really wants to know about the actual financial resources being spent. Now, you'll remember from our last episode that Sylvie's husband, Todd Ricketts, is Donald Trump's chief campaign fundraiser this year. He's the RNC finance chair. Well, before that, Todd spent years as the CEO of Ending Spending, Inc., which is a super PAC funded by Papa Joe Ricketts that spent millions to try and eliminate earmarks and what they felt was excessive public spending. And as I said in the last episode, the agenda for the billionaire oligarchs is to defund public schools and public everything else, for that matter. So that's all relevant. Also extremely relevant and still unknown back when Sylvie was making this appearance is that Sylvie and Todd Ricketts weren't paying their full property taxes right here in Wilmette for a decade. Whether intentionally or inadvertently, could have been, they've stiffed the village of Wilmette, the K-8 school district, and New Trier Township out of tens of thousands of dollars. See, Sylvia and Todd bought an older home when they first moved to Wilmette back in the aughts, and then in 2010, I believe, they also bought the house next door. Then they tore down both houses and built a big, beautiful new mansion with a koi pond, but instead of notifying the Cook County Assessor in Chicago about the new house, which they were required to do by law, uh, they kept paying taxes on the original, smaller house. Then in 2013, their tax attorney filed a property tax appeal to try and lower their property tax rate even further using a picture of the previous home and all of its details. Now, the official word was that this was an error by the attorney and that they themselves didn't know anything about it, which is mm, possible, I guess. But at the same time, that attorney also appealed the taxes on the second lot they'd purchased, arguing that rate should be much lower because there was no longer a house there. So somebody knew what was happening. And you know what? I just, I find it very hard to believe that Todd and Sylvie 
just didn't notice for 10 years, especially when during those 10 years, Sylvie and her PC brown shirts are combing over the school and village budgets with a fine tooth comb and demanding transparency. Ultimately, I think Todd agreed to pay $60,000 in back taxes, which was only for three years worth of taxes, by the way, because that's all an owner can be charged for in Cook County. But from what I've read, they probably owed twice that amount. And I don't think they ever offered to pay all of the taxes they should have paid. There's a great Chicago Tribune article by Hal Dardick, who I believe broke this story, detailing all of this that's well worth a read. We'll link to that. And this might seem like a tangent, but it's extremely germane to the story of the policy circle and to the larger free market con by these billionaire oligarchs. Because whatever they stiffed Wilmette out of, uh, stiffed me out of, and everyone else here who pays their taxes, uh, whether it was ultimately $60,000 or $100,000 or $120,000, to them, to the Ricketts, like this is the financial equivalent of buying a cup of coffee, right? But for people like me and my family who struggle to afford to live in this community and whose homes are our most valuable asset, this is a lot of money. And as they cheat us out of that money, which underfunds our schools and our village services, Sylvia Ricketts is leading the gals to Wilmette School Board meetings and wasting time bitching about overspending and writing letters lamenting the village's high property tax burden. Oh, and by the way, uh, just a bit further south, right here in Cook County, is another little property the Ricketts family owns called Wrigley Field for which Cook County gave the family an $8.5 million historic renovation property tax break when they did the big rehabbing, um, maybe whatever, how many years ago that was. And the Ricketts are also in line to receive for Wrigley more than $100 million in federal tax credits for that one. And in the trove of racist Ricketts emails I mentioned in our last uh, episode, which were leaked a couple of years ago, um, you can also read Todd's whiny emails about how much it sucks that Tom, his brother, has to bow and scrape before then Mayor Rahm Emanuel to ask for $200 million in funds to spruce up Wrigley and how they should just move the Cubs out of Cook County if they're not appreciated. Seriously, look it up. Thankfully, a Rambo said no to that one, but the way the Ricketts have behaved in Wrigleyville is worthy of its own episode. Damn. Now, for fairness, let me clarify that Rom is a prick and the Cook County tax system is unbelievably corrupt because of the Democratic machine for which no Republicans are to blame. But damn, Ricketts, just pay your fucking taxes, right? Okay, so where were we? Oh yeah, here's my sister in Christ, Beth Feely. <laughs> Ooh, we're going to swing it quite fast here. Uh, challenging racial empathy programs with the school board. So I wonder, what do systems of oppression, power, and privilege look like in a school filled with classrooms of youngsters aged 5 through 12? Seed seems to think that it's necessary for some groups to check inherent attributes, and these are often ones that people have no control over, like race or gender, before they can truly relate to others, which is ridiculous. My two-year-old mixed-race niece... Oh, Lord, she's pulling out the mixed-race niece, (laughs) the big gun... You know, that is even more powerful than having a black friend, y'all. My two-year-old mixed-race niece, whose mother, my sister, is white, and whose father, my brother-in-law, is black, doesn't need me and her uncles and her cousins and her grandmother and her grandfather to check her white, our white privilege. She needs us to love her, teach her about the golden rule, and encourage her to be anything she wants to be in life. Also, if you can please define the terms equity, inclusivity, and diversity as it relates to our school climate, the equity team initiative, and teaching our kids about empathy, kindness, and compassion. So you'll remember that Beth is the one Sylvie lifts up specifically as someone who really flourished in the policy circle, and boy, did she. Because in addition to co-founding the Anti-Anti-Racism 1776 Unites Project, uh, Beth's published some really nasty, highly accusatory and let's just say it, flat-out racist articles about both New Trier and our neighboring high school Evanston Township, or ETHS, and their administrations. Both of these are nationally recognized high schools, and Beth published them in The Federalist and in The National Review, respectively. So, not just uh, little local op-eds here. And as I said in the last episode, let me clarify again that when I accuse Beth or Sylvie of doing something racist, I don't mean that they're personally racist or that they hate black people. How would I know any of that? What I mean is that they prop up the system that perpetuates systemic racism 
while denying it even exists, which is worse, quite honestly, because it does a lot more damage. But these K-8 school board appearances um, by the Policy Circle ladies were in February of 2017. This is just days after Seminar Day, where the fake controversy there failed to get the day canceled or overhauled. So you got to imagine the PC gals are pretty amped up right now about this uh, equity and inclusion program being planned for younger students here in Wilmette. And I imagine Silly would say such a program propels victimhood status for black students. Because after all, that's what she said about Seminar Day. So anyway, the board surveyed teachers and students, and then they also mailed uh, surveys out to parents in the district uh, to see what the climate actually was around diversity. And when the gals came back in the June school board meeting, the results were shocking. Just shocking, I tell you. Tonight I'm here. I'd like to ask how the school board and the administration uh, will address the results from the 2017 school climate survey finding that teachers, students, and parents all reported that children with conservative views are being not respected and even in some cases harassed. You know, in, in uh, reviewing the report on the CRC survey about school climate, um, there was a comment in there that said the second highest number of comments from the CRC survey were about political ideology, specifically with respect to the sentiment that students with conservative views are not respected and are even harassed in the D39 schools. In short, conservative students are more likely to feel excluded, not respected, and even harassed than almost any other group in the school. Again, this was unsolicited, and this was seen across all three survey students, parents, and teachers. Now, this is a very oily and adroit bit of handiwork by Beth, Betts, and Syl. So this is uh, like a game of telephone, really. Uh, you know, like Beth starts out, she's actually right on the facts. Uh, Sylvie hops up to twist them a little bit, and then Betsy, the closer, takes the mic to fire home the false conclusion that conservative students are more likely to feel excluded, not respected, and harassed than almost any other group in the school. So this is worth looking at because right here, right now, we just see how a nonpartisan, fact-based report like this CRC survey can be made political before our very eyes. Now, in the actual survey, parents were asked to rate their level of agreement or disagreement with the following statement. People of different backgrounds slash opinions slash learning styles feel included at my child's school. Okay, fair enough. Are kids who are different in any way being excluded? So now I'll read from the official survey report. Quote, In the parents' open-ended responses after this question, where they were asked to please comment below, the greatest number of comments were about students' race slash ethnicity. End quote. All right, no shocker there. Equal treatment for racial groups, particularly black Americans, was of particular concern during the first month of the Trump administration, only a week or two after the fake Seminar Day controversy at New Trier. And it's been an historic problem in New Trier Township that remains to this day. So, makes sense. All right, reading again. Quote, The second highest number of comments were about political ideology, specifically with respect to the sentiment that students with conservative views are not respected and are even harassed in D39 schools, end quote. So now we need to hold the phone a minute here, y'all. Parents who made open-ended comments to this survey, okay, wrote in that conservative kids were being harassed. Not as many as said racism was a problem, but enough parents for this issue to come in second. Now, could the policy circle have orchestrated this result, which they themselves found so shocking and outrageous? I have no proof to offer other than common sense, which compels me to say, hell yes, they could have. In fact, I think Charlotte from accounting got tapped to coordinate the write-in campaign at the last circle meeting, didn't she? Now, the only actual proof I can offer is anecdotal, and it is a little shameful, and it is this. The results of this parent survey were skewed, in part, to me not taking the time to respond to it which I feel guilty about now. But with things like this, low response rates are the rule rather than the exception, I think. And we all need to, I need to do better. Okay, so I'm pledging to you, I'll do better. Uh, so the effectiveness of this kind of mobilized response seems pretty obvious to me, even though I am speculating. But I also will acknowledge that a lot of conservative kids probably were being harassed in early 2017, in fairness. And that's because their idiot parents had just elected Donald Trump as our president. Donald Trump is our president. 
But here's uh, the subtle but important wrinkle from this report. Quote, it should be noted that even though political ideology was not specifically asked about in the surveys, responses to this effect indicating that students with conservative political views were not being treated well at school were seen across the board in all three surveys, including those submitted to parents, teachers, and students in grades five through eight. End quote. All right, this is a very important distinction, and it seems like I'm in the weeds here. I am a little bit, but to be fair to Sylvie's crew, there were teachers and students who volunteered that conservative kids were not being treated well, all right? But it does not say that conservatives were the second most bullied group, or even that the number of such comments from students or teachers was all that high. It just said they exist. In fact, here's my final quote, quote, the outside group that conducted the survey concluded that parents felt that these groups were less included than students and teachers did, end quote. So now we get outrage based on a conclusion that was second highest only among parents, presumably egged on by those speaking at the meeting, and it is uh, making the outrage about how white conservatives are being treated rather than about addressing racial issues uh, with our children and the bullying they might face in school. So this is the tail wagging the dog, policy circle style. Uh, viewpoint diversity is essential to the education process. Uh, that this information had not been sought out by this survey but was revealed in it should make it a priority. Um, and I also, I do appreciate the CRC for highlighting it in their report. I want to, as well, to hear what plan the school has for addressing the issue of harassment for political philosophy um, for conservative students. Uh, it would be worth defining uh, conservative views, which are really views that believe that we should um, have a small, efficient government, and that government is not always the solutions to to all the problems, and that that's it. So, so there's a lot of resources I think that teachers could use to provide the two point of views. There's isit.org that has uh, different small videos. There's PragerU also that offers videos, perhaps for uh, eighth graders. All right, notice Sylvie in her hushed tones, is leveraging these survey results now to attempt to push far-right curricula into the school board. Isit.com, she mentions, these are educational vids with a decidedly free market libertarian bent, while PragerU, the source she suggests is appropriate for 7th and 8th graders, is flat-out YouTube far-right propaganda. And by the way, PragerU is a 501c3 charity funded by right-wing billionaires. Okay, so that was just a little sidetrack into my own speculation about the policy circle's doings. But there is one more extremely important piece to this policy circle puzzle. And this is where every community, not just ours, is in legitimate danger. And it's around dark money and stealth candidates being backed in local elections by outside groups. So this has wrecked havoc on school boards across the country, but its larger impact is really only now starting to be felt. Now, if you watch Tip of the Spear, you'll see that when I started to point out these connections between the Seminar Day attacks and Betsy Hart and the Policy Circle and Sylvie and Beth and also Dan Proft, who's the conservative talk show radio host with a big mouth and a very strange and lingering interest in Seminar Day, they all kept accusing me of slander, saying that there was no connection between these groups and that I was just a crazy conspiracy theorist. Betsy actually went off on me on Chicago Tonight, which is a, a well-known PBS show in Chicago, and Dan invited me onto his show to tear into me there. So you can find both of those appearances on our website or with a Google search, but it was a local election that happened in April of that year, in 2017, when all of the strands of this came together, and which I believe was the actual focus of the new Trier Township long con all along. And appropriately enough, it started with Sylvie's very first radio appearance back in the fall of 2016. And guess where? Dan and Amy. Now, Amy, have you heard of the policy circle? The woman's policy circle? The poly yeah. Yes, I have. It's, uh, it seems to be catching on. For more on this, we're happy to be joined by Sylvie Lazare Ricketts. I, I, Amy took French. I did not, so I hope I pronounced that name correctly. Sylvie, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. 
So we uh, started actually in Wilmette with uh, just a few women, 15 women in my living room, and we just got together after um, I've attended some conference, a conference around public policy, and we just started discussing, you know, the book, Milton Friedman's book, uh, Free to Choose, and it kind of went from there. Good start. So you're coming from a, a free market perspective, as you mentioned, and, uh, you know, starting with Friedman is a, a good start. I mean, I'm happy to, to be a facilitator and provide everybody a reading list if, if you want, for those that don't know. I mean, <laughs> Dan I've, inserts I've, himself again. I've done, I've done you're it, not a woman, Dan. I've done it for Amy, and, uh, yes. and she's come a long way, baby. So as you probably gathered from this short clip, Dan is a bit of a douchebag, but He and Sylvie are bonding over Milton Friedman and their shared love for free market economics, the pressing women's issue of the day. Uh, Dan even offers to help teach the little ladies about Friedman if they want him to. Okay, so what else? Is this also an incubator for future candidates for office? Uh, People kind of building a support network and, uh, as you say, kind of learning more about the issues through that peer-to-peer dialogue. And maybe someday we'll have uh, some of these participants uh, running for state and federal offices. Hopefully, you know, that's what's something, you know, originally when we started this, we, it was really, the idea was really to deepen the understanding. And then something magical happened is that, you know, women start encouraging each other to, to run for different positions, whether it's at the very local district, you know, park districts, school boards, city level, and then even in Congress. <gasps> something magical happened at this nonpartisan, non-political group that is legally prohibited from any political involvement, women just found their voices and started to encourage each other to run for local and state offices. But isn't that illegal? You know, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit, so the idea is to really be a platform for women to jump into the arena and then also for them to, to develop their network to feel supported when they do so. Now, how often do you ladies meet? So we encourage, what we've done is we've developed a year of conversation. So we suggest that circles meet every other month around a specific team, but they could really choose to meet around whatever topic they want to. So in Illinois, we've had, for instance, one meeting uh, around a school district uh, consolidation in our uh, in our area, for instance. And that was came from a uh, report that was developed by the Illinois Policy Institute. So it was very specific to our circle, to our area, and something that we just wanted to learn more about. So folks, this long con was already underway, and the pieces were already in play in the fall of 2016. Sylvie says that the Illinois Policy Institute is a think tank that helped them to study and prepare a brief on the possibility of dissolving a local school district in their area. Sylvie doesn't say, nor does Dan offer, that Dan himself was a senior policy fellow at the Illinois Policy Institute at the time, so that he's undoubtedly already been working with these little ladies, most likely helping them to craft the brief she just mentions. But it just didn't come up for some reason. And then, suddenly, in early 2017, we had a contested township election. The first one that had ever happened in New Trier Township, stretching back more than 100 years. And this is when Eric Zorn, a popular columnist for the Chicago Tribune, started to take an interest. I started getting phone calls from people up up in this area about the township races, and you know people are always sending me email about various controversies in areas, and you know you should look into this, you should look into that. Um, but this story seemed to have more purchase because the the allegations people were talking about was that was that a larger network of people in Illinois were trying to take over and win this township race, and so you know, and that led me to make a lot of phone calls, start talking to people, and, and really get the, the nitty-gritty of the story as was going on. I knew that it was something that the community was interested in. But what was really driving me to get up here was this idea that this thing that nobody actually seems to care about, which is these township races, was suddenly a, a real focus of community interest, that people were realizing that in these small units of government, our footholds, our, our rungs on the ladder to greater power, it's the same thing that the Republican Party realized in 2010 when they began the project of trying to win back state houses. And it was a brilliant strategy on their part to realize that at the smallest level, government doesn't seem like it does very much, it doesn't seem like it's very important. Like, who's your state legislator? Well, they probably just vote with a party, it doesn't really matter. 
But ultimately, if you concentrate on enough of those races, if you concentrate on these state representative races, you concentrate on even smaller races, these township races, you can start getting your hands on the levers of power. And it's a fascinating story, really, and it's one that ought to resonate not just with people around the Chicago area, but all over the country when they start looking, looking at these small elections and realize what's really at stake in some of them. All right. Believe it or not, these local elections were every bit as exciting as the Seminar Day controversy. I know that seems like a stretch. But let me uh, introduce you to Peter Tyor. He is the extremely nice volunteer who chairs uh, the new Trier Citizens League, and he's going to describe the elections. It's, it's the, what's called the municipal consolidated elections. People generally don't pay a lot of attention. Not the November elections, but elections in March, slate in December. The new Trier Citizens League recruits people to serve uh, in these positions, and we've done it for 100 years. It's done on a nonpartisan way. The clerk, on the very last day that you could file, uh, said, we now have an opposing slate. And he, he was, was rightly, oh, he was kind of enthused about this. He'd never, never seen a, an opposition slate, and we had no idea who these folks were. And on the, the form that you're looking at is called a D1, and it, it defines the organization and so on. And uh, they said, as their purpose, to elect free market candidates, which seemed odd to, I mean, you're talking about a township, a small little area. Okay. Okay, so Peter mentions the D1, which is the form that candidates file to run for local office in Illinois, or any office, I don't know, I'm... Not as involved as I should be. And now, my friend Leslie Wyrick, who we met briefly in our last episode, will explain why this particular D1 is so unique. We had never seen before a D1 filing that was across governmental bodies, so we had a school board person, a park district person, and the Nutra Township all filed together, say, saying they were free market candidates, <laughs> and any proceeds from the money they raised would go back to the Liberty Pack. And then it was this mad dash, like, what the hell is the Liberty Pack? Yeah, what, what are yeah. they talking about? What's happening here? And and that was really when we realized this was this was active campaigning, right? Well, all of those folks were also involved in All Seminar Day. I mean, what the hell was Dan Proft? Where is he from anyway? Cicero, the city? I don't know. What was he doing on a new cheer parents page saying awful things about our high school. What was he doing showing up at that school board meeting? And then now we have this election with these people filing um, with this Liberty Pact thing that we think he's connected to as well. So what right. was going on? <laughs> so this was the moment that I realized that I was no longer putting together a video just to alert the neighbors to the shady workings of this billionaire-funded women's group. I was making an actual documentary about actual news. On uh, January 22nd, 2017, I got an email. Good evening, gentlemen. I'm contacting you on behalf of the three independent candidates for New Trier Township trustees. And they named the three independent candidates, Kathy, Bob, and Stacy. We understand that one of the sitting trustees has decided to withdraw his candidacy. Uh, and he did because he did not want to be in a contested election. So we then had to slate another person. And what Danielle was writing about was, could her candidates appear at this slating session? And we said, yes, of course they can appear. Okay, does that make sense? Peter Tyor has been volunteering and running this caucus for years. It's bipartisan, never been contested in a century. Very last minute, a new independent slate files to run, end of 2016, right at the beginning of 2017. And because of this, one of Peter's candidates drops out because he doesn't want to be involved in a contested election in his community. And then this woman named Danielle Mergner sends Peter an email asking if her candidates can go to the public meeting that the new Trier Citizens Council is holding to assign someone else to this suddenly open trustee slot on their slate. Got it? But after Peter responds to this email, very graciously, I thought, she sends another email and makes an unforced error that completely exposes the con. I, in turn, sent her an email saying, uh, uh, Dear Danielle, I've, I've circulated your email. Look forward to speaking this evening. Could you please send me copies of their, the independent candidate's resumes? That's the email. I sent it to her. She then sent an email to, uh, because she had CC'd 
the, the independent candidates. She then replied, uh, but not realizing that I was on her email. She said, I'll read this email uh, from Danielle, um, Kathy, Bob, and Stacy. It's not my intent to provide resumes as the EP, Economy Party, has asked. Just give me three points to share about you. Um, I will say that you're running because we can do things better, offer better services, et cetera, et cetera. Why don't you give me three points that I can just put forward as w why you're running? Next paragraph. Finally, IOP is wary of this for good reasons, but we have good reasons for going forward. My intent tonight is to listen. So let's see what they're willing to do, and I'll have to get a final okay from you. Um, in Danielle's email, uh, she's, she refers to IOP, and we believe that's the Illinois Opportunity Project. Uh, it, made, it made the most sense, uh, given the context. IOP has run candidates, they have uh, run forums, uh, they tend to be a very conservative, small government uh, uh, organization. Again, I don't want to say anti-government, but some people have said that. Yes, they have. Some people like me, and people like Leslie. Right. So I, I think that was the point about the connection between um, what happened with All Seminar Day and the policy circle, that there were just enough connections. And then we were proven um, right, because then the Illinois Policy Institute started, um, there was evidence that one of the school board candidates on this free market slate of candidates um, was had received training from the Illinois Opportunity Project, which is also mm -hmm. linked to... Illinois Policy Institute, which mm -hmm. is where the policy circle gets a lot of their briefs, which we had evidence of until they locked down the website. Um, yeah, you can still access some of their policy briefs, in fact. Really, the, the lockdown stuff is the place where they kind of coordinate and share info. Right. And they're, they're super secretive about their meetings. I think it's far more edited, Paul, than it was. I really do. So now I've confused it further, probably, but I can explain it easily, I think. So remember Heather Higgins and the Independent Women's Forum slash Voice? They were two arms of the same group we talked about last time. One a 501c3 that can't be political. One a 501c4 arm that can? All right, same thing here, right? Illinois Policy Institute, where Dan was a senior fellow, is part of the State Policy Network. Uh, it has a sister organization called IOP, the Illinois Opportunity Project, which is a 501c4 political arm. So IOP has three partners listed on the website, a couple of attorneys named Pat Hughes, who was the fixer, you'll remember, from the Seminar Day Con back in episode one, and Matt Bessler. And then the third partner is Dan Proft. So we have confirmation that this election, which has never been contested, now has an opposition slate running, which is receiving candidate training and support from Dan Proft's group IOP and maybe even financing. Because that D1 they filed where all leftover campaign funds go to the Liberty PAC, so there are only two possible Illinois super PACs that fit that bill. One is actually called Liberty PAC and is run by Matt Bessler, Dan's attorney partner at IOP. So that is the most likely one. But I should just point out here, as we covered in episode one, that Dan Proft himself also runs an extremely well-funded PAC called Liberty Principles PAC, which has taken in over 20 million bucks in donations from right-wing billionaire donor Dick Uline, our former, then current, Illinois governor, Bruce Rauner, and he's got at least 50K from Todd Ricketts himself, probably from his property tax savings. And we know Dan's think tank, the Illinois Policy Institute, has been helping the policy circle craft a policy brief on dissolving local school districts. And I should stress that Nutria Township is a separate entity from the school district, but uh, there have been discussions in some camps about uh, dissolving the township for years. And then this mysterious slate shows up out of nowhere and doesn't want to share anything about itself. But the three candidates Peter mentioned are Kathy, Bob, and Stacy, and their manager, and their manager rather, is Danielle Merkner. All right, you don't have to remember all this, but I'll just say that Bob of Kathy, Bob, and Stacy uh, lives in Nutria Township, and he used to work for IOP, while Kathy and Stacy are both members of the Policy Circle. Knock me over with a feather. Danielle Merkner is also a Policy Circle member, and even as she was writing to Peter Tyor about her independent slate of candidates. She'd already been tapped, but not yet announced that year as the new incoming chairperson of the Nutria Republican organization. So, did she actually come to Peter's meeting? And, and she did come to our meeting. 
uh, and said, how about uh, three of you drop out, <laughs> one of you can stay, and, and my three folks will, will take over. And, and we said, well, no, we really didn't. Well, again, we never knew who these people were. We never got a resume. We never got anything from them. I'm just trying to paint this picture because this woman that nobody's ever heard of asks to come into your final reslate right, meeting right. after eight months to get you to consider putting a majority of people you've never heard of into this. Right. And she doesn't want to tell you anything about them. They Correct. Remember, she said uh, in her email, give me three points, uh, what, uh, what I can say about why you want to do this. But she never, never actually really even did that. We termed this stealth candidacy. And you think they were being secretive by design? Yes, I do. They called themselves the Independent Slate, and Daniel was their manager. Uh, they'd served in a variety of uh, uh, anti-tax, I won't say anti-government, I'd just say small government, uh, something that most of the people who live in New Trier Township absolutely oppose. I mean, you come to New Trier because you want good schools and good services, good parks, good libraries. These are things that government should provide, and most people in New Trier uh, are happy to pay. They're, I won't say happy. Most people in New Trier understand the need to pay for them. This is what makes it such a perfect example of a long con. Outside forces using disinformation to hide their actual agenda because they know that the majority of voters, progressive and conservative alike, would reject their actual anti-government agenda. But this idea of a right-wing conspiracy is a fairly hard sell, especially to seasoned journalists like Eric Zorn, who's seen these machinations in Cook County for years. I don't understand why, when outside people would like to move their candidates up in some of these smaller races, they don't just own it. I mean, there's nothing illegal about it. There's nothing particularly shameful about it. If you've recognized a political opportunity, you want to take it, you want to train your candidates. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Um, it is kind of odd if, they, if they're denying it. And that was one of the intriguing things to me when I was you know, doing some preliminary reporting on this was people were, were acting like there was no connection between, you know, like, oh, we, we, I don't have any idea what you're talking about, who these people are. No, I don't know. I'm not connected to them. And it's like, why, why, would you, why would you care? Why is that? I mean, it's, you, you talk about, is this a conspiracy? I think conspiracy is a, is a really loaded word. It's just sort of a, a, a funded effort that makes perfectly good political sense. The problem for me arises in politics, in big and small levels, is when the transparency is gone, when people are trying to obscure the motives of people, when they're trying to obscure the funding and try to obscure the connections. I, you know, I, I think these connections are perfectly logical, uh, and the goals are, are as far as, as, far as uh, you know, are, are legitimate in terms of, you know, they're politically legitimate. Whether I agree with them or not is beside the point. The question is, is this a legitimate way to you know, try to win offices and try to take power. Yeah, it's a legitimate avenue. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I resist taking sides in the idea that it's a conspiracy, uh -huh. you know. This is a very fair point. And honestly, probably the most reasonable one, certainly the most balanced one. Because as soon as you use the word conspiracy, people want to size you for that tinfoil hat. But I thought Peter had the best take. The whole purpose of this is to obscure and hide the source of funding, the source of support, the ideological underpinnings. Uh, so it's, it's the sign of a very good conspiracy uh, that there's very little hard evidence. You have to draw inferences. Uh, it was just by error that we got this email. And if we, and if we did not have this, um, it would have been uh, more difficult to, to make these linkages. So once Leslie and I connected these dots, we started to alert the community, and I decided to make a documentary, right? I ran a Kickstarter campaign to raise money so I could finish it, and so I could rent out the local Wilmette movie theater to show it on just before the township election. It's in East Wilmette, not far from the Ricketts and the Feelys houses, so I thought that would be fun. Uh, so it was going to be tight on time because the election was only two months away, but I thought I had it figured out. We would screen this on a Wednesday night, and then New Trier was on spring break the following week, and then the election was be that Tuesday night right after we came back from spring break. So um, does that make sense? On Tuesday afternoon, it was exactly two weeks before the election, and the day before my scheduled movie premiere, I got a cease and desist letter. And then I had to get an attorney, stat. And in a moment of true serendipity, uh, it turned out that not only was one of the dads in my neighborhood an excellent defamation lawyer who's argued cases before the Illinois Supreme Court, 
but he also happens to be a fellow Hoosier who grew up just north of me in Indy and went to North Central. North Central's not going to matter to any of you, but if you're from Indy, it will. All right, anyway, so his name is uh, Mike Lieber, and here's how he tells it. I took a look at the letter, read through the letter, and I don't want to say that the arguments in it were laughable, but let's just say they weren't particularly legally sound. I think the letter was sent to you on a Tuesday, uh, and you were going to show the movie on a Wednesday. It did, it did spook you a little bit, uh, and understandably. When people get a cease and desist letter, that scares them. Uh, anytime somebody says, look, we're going to sue you, the natural inclination is to be scared and to say, whoa, okay. Um, and, and you did put the movie on hold for a week or so. I did. Well, and, I, and no one had seen it. Like when I showed it to you, that was the first time that anyone had seen any of it because I had been making it as I went. That was the first time I'd watched it. So I just wasn't feeling like I was in the mind space where I could safely put it out there without, you know, any idea of if I was okay. I mean, I thought I was, but, you know, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Right. You were gracious enough to screen it for me. And we watched it over the weekend. I remember sitting in my living room watching the movie, you know, and stopping and asking you questions and saying, are you sure that this is true? Do you have backup? And for everything you did, I felt like the message of your movie was important to get out there. And I wanted to make sure that it could get, get out there. I don't like the idea of pro what's called prior restraint, people trying to prevent other people from speaking. Yeah, so thank God for Michael Lieber. But if you think about everywhere else that these dark money groups have stuck their fingers into local elections, it is just extraordinarily chilling. I mean, not everybody can find a top shelf defamation lawyer who lives a couple blocks away and says, yeah, I'm free Saturday. Come on over. Show me your movie. And not everyone has the time or is stubborn enough to dig in like I did and make a movie on this story. But this enormous network of fake charities, this immense policy combine, as I call it, is stretching its tentacles into the smallest local races in the country, with basically unlimited resources, as Leslie pointed out. And they had beautiful photography, professional mailers, a gorgeous website, they had candidate training, and it was a real kind of David and Goliath. They had all these resources, a, a whole foundation organization set up. I mean, really, if you put a dollar amount to all the free press they got at North Cook News and those, mm -hmm. I mean, they have their huge mailing lists, um, to run against that is really challenging and really off-putting. And it really affects our local government, that good people who just want to volunteer, these are unpaid positions, they want to help out in their community, who wants to run as just the guy off the street that just cares about his parks to against all that. So this is the thing. The money and power that are backing these groups, the, the roots that run under the ground all over the country and can send up little green shoots wherever they like, is almost incomprehensible. And these legions of fake charities aren't just a side project. This is a major investment for these donors, and they expect a return on it. But if you look at the windfalls for billionaires generated by just the Bush tax cuts, the Trump tax cuts, and the slashing of regulations and safety measures in those administrations, they get that return. In fact, they undoubtedly get a better direct return on investment from funding these fake charities while getting a very nice tax write-off than they do in the stock market over time. And if you need any further proof, just look at the increasing wealth gap in this country. These billionaire families are richer than like the richest kings in history. And they are turning America into a nation of serfs and indentured servants. So I did end up canceling the movie screening because when push came to shove, I was going on fumes and I just couldn't gamble at all on whether they'd sue me or not. Even a specious lawsuit from these folks could bankrupt me. And I'm just a dad in the neighborhood. One of the poor dads in the neighborhood, quite frankly. So I went to the theater that night to find a pretty good turnout waiting, and a lot of the audience, of course, had supported the Kickstarter, and so I just stood up and I told them I couldn't show it, and I just started talking about why, and I spoke off the cuff for, I don't know, 80 minutes. I pulled an all-nighter, so I don't know what I said, but I conducted a Q&A as well, and I got lots of concerned questions, and I got several angry and defiant ones, and I just field fielded them all the best I could, and I thought it might be over at that point, but... I had no idea that Eric Zorn, uh, this popular columnist from the Trib, was actually sitting in the audience that night. So then you, you got here on the Wednesday night. You found out when you got here that we weren't, that we canceled it. Right. Um, so then the first that you, that you knew really about it was when I got up and started talking. 
Yeah, I think I, I think I think I, I must have found out about it when I sat down, and started started when you stood up and said you weren't going to show the movie. And my because my first thought was, oh no, there goes my column peg. I'm not going to be able to see the movie. How can I write about it? I don't have the I don't have the structure of the column that I needed. And, and how am I going to sa salvage this? But then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, maybe this all just makes the story better as it is. I mean, maybe the fact that you are afraid to show the movie demonstrates the concern that some people have that you're getting too close to some sort of truth that they don't want told. And so that whole thing, I think, actually made the, what I ended up writing a little bit more interesting, a little bit better, the fact that you were afraid to show it and you've been threatened, and, and that sort of raised the stakes of the, of the issue even more. And I, and I believe that the fact that you didn't show the movie that first night gave some air to the conversation that followed. And that lucky break that he was there did give this thing some air, enough air to catch fire. So Eric wrote a column that week asking, in New Trier is a right-wing plot unfolding? And suddenly everyone was paying attention. Uh, Mike Lieber had a back and forth with the attorney who'd sent the cease and desist letter. And that attorney said they wouldn't sue if they could sign off on the video beforehand which we knew was ridiculous, but I thought, you know, maybe we could at least use that to figure out who was behind the letter. A lawyer's reaching out to me and making demands, making pretty big demands saying, you must not show this movie unless you let my client see it first. They didn't even want to reveal who they were, uh, which, you know, kind of makes you think, who's pulling the levers here? Who, you know, who, who is hiring this lawyer? Why did these people not want to be identified? That, that always raises some, uh, some red flags for me. Yeah, he said like three of them by name, or he said four of them by name and then said there were three others, is that right? Right, in, in his letter he mentioned four people. He said, I represent a number of clients, including these four people. So what did they say, individuals or people? How was that? I mean, there was some, like, some question of like the three people, like could it have been a corporation? Could it have been you know, a group? Could it have been an organization, a 501c3? I mean, do we know that it was people? We aren't sure if all of his clients were people. I mean, here's what he says. He said, I represent the four people named in the first line of my letter and three others who do not wish to be identified. Now, three others could be people, it could be corporations, it could be groups, we don't know. And he never identified, Mr. Merrill never identified who his other clients were. For me as a lawyer, I'm not gonna allow somebody to pre-screen my client's movie without even knowing who I'm showing it to. That's, that's just, that's a non-starter. So that was all just crazy. And thankfully, they were bluffing because once we said, we're showing it anyway, the lawyer disappeared. But the Policy Circle folks didn't. In fact, on the night of the canceled premiere, that first Wednesday night, the theater got threatening phone calls, the cops were stationed out front, and a fairly big crowd came to the theater. But once it was all over and done and everyone went home, probably around 10 p.m. or so, um, I said goodbye to the theater manager as he was locking up. And our little village of Wilmette has a downtown that's like basically a single intersection with a line of shops and restaurants goes for a block in either direction. And we started to get more restaurants, but um, even a couple years ago, when I walked uh, to my car, the streets of Wilmette are empty uh, because they pretty much roll up the sidewalks after 10 on a weeknight. But as I was passing the restaurant directly next door to the theater, um, there was a fairly big group in the bar, at least 20 people that were all standing together and chatting. And I could see through the window that it was Beth Feely and her husband, Sylvie and Todd Ricketts, and a number of other gals from the policy circle, all just hanging out together on a Wednesday night, cocktailing next door to the canceled screening of my movie about them. So I thought about grabbing my iPhone and just like barging into the restaurant and saying, hi, everybody. Um, but, uh, you know, I was just so damn tired. Uh, I couldn't do it. But we had a happy ending. Anyway. The first night when you were going to show the movie, you had a pretty close to full house, I think. I think some people ended up taking off because they were disappointed that the movie wasn't going to be screened. But a lot of people stuck around to hear what you had to say. Now, a week and a half later, when you actually showed the movie, not only did you show it in one of the two theaters, you had to show it in both of the two theaters. And if memory serves, I think they were both either full or just about to capacity. So it was a great turnout. I mean, between those two theaters, it's got to be 300 
plus people, 400 people. And we did a second screening in one of them for another 100, 150 after that. Right, so I mean, a lot of people, three, four, 500 people got a chance to see the movie. I think the movie absolutely had an effect on the election because for a few weeks there was this buildup to the movie being released, then it wasn't released, then it ultimately was, and there was the drama with the cease and desist letters, these dueling letters back and forth. Eric Zorn's big column in the Chicago Tribune. And all of this happened. The movie came out just two days before the election. And then when we got to the election results, these hand-picked people who were, you know, possibly coordinating with these shadowy group of unknown uh, folks, well, they ended up getting their rear ends kicked. The independent slate was defeated soundly, which was good news. But it's just one wave in an endless tide that is washing across this country. And either we're going to fix it or it's going to drown us all, people. I mean, this is real. Here's how Leslie put it. I've been a part of local elections for so long, and I am a progressive. I do vote Democrat. But I am a staunch supporter of local elections staying local. I mean, I'll be honest, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I honestly don't want to have to be a watchdog to every caucus every governmental monthly, weekly, bi-weekly meeting, I truly trust the people that have been elected to do the right thing, honestly. And when you get outsiders with outside money, influence, then that really is concerning about what's going to happen to your parks, your schools, your township. All right. So I've put you through the ringer a bit, and I'm sorry, but I also hope this shows that we can control our own democracy nationally and locally, but we all have to take the time to value it, to participate in it, and to nurture it. Because if there's one thing we've learned recently, it is that democracy is extremely fragile, especially against the onslaught of dark money. So, one more thing I need to share that you're going to want to hear. Well, maybe you're not going to want to hear, but you really need to hear. So this is yet another clip I got from the Policy Circle website. And uh, this is audio from a breakout session at the annual Policy Circle Summit, where they bring circle leaders in from all over the country to Chicago to wine and dine and rock and roll them with Sylvie Ricketts using Wrigley Field as their playground. And remember, this is a rare session um, from one of these types of groups in the sense that it's recorded and available to the public for viewing. At least for now, we'll see if they pull it from the website. But it's uh, three professional media operatives offering insight, best practices, and tips for all of the Policy Circle ladies about how they can affect change in their own communities. And you decide for yourself if this sounds like democracy, okay? So I've streamlined this hour-long presentation into about five minutes or less, and it might be the most important thing you hear in this episode. The, the goal of today's presentation, or the purpose of it, is to basically give you something that you can utilize for whatever it is you might be doing. Uh, the, the whole uh, point of us three doing this today is that uh, I'm the grassroots expert, so to speak, uh, here. It, my goal in any client uh, interaction is to basically build a crowd around an idea. So. You're looking to do something, you might hire somebody like me to come in and say, okay, so where are the people? How do we get them excited about this? How do we get them to show up when we need them to show up? Uh, that's what the grassroots effort is that a lot of times my company will lead. Uh, Liz is uh, the PR pro here on the stage, and Heather actually runs the government affairs shop for the Chicago Cubs. Maybe you've heard of them. World champion Chicago Cubs, 2016. Yeah. In the political campaign world, those that spend the most win the most. It's, it's a fact. I can show you study after study after study. I think you probably know that yourself anyway. And it might be a little disheartening to people. But you know, in the example that I'm bringing you today, this local ordinance issue, we did it for zero money. I ended up spending $8,500 total on this, and it was donated from people who supported the cause. What we did in this particular suburb to try to get people motivated on this is we said, they are gonna, I'm going to get this on the agenda for a village board meeting, and they're going to have to deal with it, and we're going to pack that room with as many people as we can and force them to take up the issue. We had 50 people sign in to testify on behalf of our issue. By the time the third person had testified, the board cut off debate and said, we're going to table this. They came back two weeks later and passed a ordinance that took all of the restrictions out. I like that uh, expression, neighbor stacking. <laughs> I like that a lot. Um, and that kind of goes back to what someone one of the other presenters was talking about this morning is 
when you have to ask people to help you. Like, what can you do for me? There's, I have to do a lot of that. Like in our experience with the Cubs and us trying to do our development around Ridley Field, which I think a lot of you are going to see uh, later tonight if you're coming to Billy Joel, there was a lot of misinformation spread and there still is about what we're doing and how we're doing it and what our intentions are. And that is really, it makes our job more difficult um, as you know, like as we build our credibility, so this is, you can see how this is all tying together. So it's just back to like always being on message, always saying the same thing over and over again, not straying, you knowing who your audience is, and maybe the nuances where you may change things, but just like like staying the course, really. Nowadays, uh, social media is key, and quite frankly, Facebook is key. And there is a company that is based in Chicago that works with professional teams, not the Cubs, uh, where they test what their fans want to hear. And there's social reaction, social listening reaction, and they literally go back and tell the management or the key players that talk to the media, use these words or these phrases, and they are seeing 30 to 35% positive social media engagement because those key phrases or words are being used. In terms of earned media, there's television, there's radio, there's print, uh, there are podcasts now, there are influencer posts, uh, all kinds of things that are technically earned media. Those, that's media that you're not paying to have done directly. And then there's paid media, which is media that you are paying for. And that would be your traditional radio ads, TV ads, digital ads that you see everywhere that you can't avoid, that follow you around. Um, and now you can also do something which I would call paid news. Um, there are all kinds of sites out there that look to be like the Tribune or some other online newspaper, but you actually pay them money and then they will print a story exactly as you want it on their site and make it look like a news story. So in situations like mine, if you weren't able to get the Tribune to cover it, you might resort to one of those paid stories which doesn't cost very much and then you know, you're going to go back and now as we go to the Create Your Own, you're going you're gonna to take that media and you're going to have it pushed out on your Facebook page and say, oh, look at this story from the Illinois Business Times or whatever, uh, talking about you know, our particular issue. I have two quick anecdotal stories. Speaking of the news organizations that create themselves and they call themselves news, uh, there is a real <laughs> example of one of those organizations being quoted on the floor of Congress by a congressman saying, I told this, this blah, 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 such, reported this, and this is why it's so important. And he was holding up the story that w ran from the organization that started itself. And I don't know if that makes sense, but it went all the way down to the floor of Congress. And so the client, not mine, another client friend was like, oh my God, the congressman just held up our own newspaper. And it was, that's how far it got. So when John's talking about self-publication, that's exactly what it is. Uh, there's a company in Illinois that's based in Illinois. They have 19 newspapers in Illinois, online newspapers, and they have about 190 across the country. And that looks like news, but it's their own news that they're pushing out. But it looks like news. It that people pay does. them for. Yeah. 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 And it's you know, small subscription services. Some of them are free, too. So that paid news outlet with 19 fake Newspapers in Illinois and 190 across the country? Guess who runs it? Dan Proft. And he funds it through his Liberty Principles Pack. So one of the outlets in this fake news empire is uh, called North Cook News, and it delivers fake news catered specifically to New Trier Township, and they send it to all of us, making it look like an actual local newspaper. And between Seminar Day and the township races, North Cook News published over two dozen fake and or misleading stories about the election and about Seminar Day. All right, so let's end the episode by letting an actual ethical journalist offer some closing thoughts. When you, when you talk about, um, I mean, that's why I think transparency is so important. You talk about these groups like ALEC, you know, where they write legislation in one place and then it shows up in state houses all across the country. Uh, that These are not <clears throat> grassroots ideas from legislators in their various states on how they can make life better for people. It's, it is something that's generated on a national scale. And I think, you know, I think like a sunlight is always the best way to deal with problems like that, to you know, tell people the truth, have it be open about who's behind stuff and why they're behind it. And again, you know, in, in some cases, there's nothing shameful about it. You know, some places just think that they, they want political power, 
The other side wants political power, and, they're, and this is how they're, how they're doing it. Um, but if you're, if you're doing it you know, behind the scene, if you're, if you're doing things that are, that are unethical or behind the scenes and hiding it from people, that's something that's a little different. I think it's important to call that kind of thing out. But again, I mean, the problem here is not necessarily conspiracies, but it, it is a lack of transparency. And that's you know, what we try to provide you know, at the Tribune and at other news organizations. We try to look at these things and say, okay, you know, what's going on here may not be illegal. It's not illegal to print something that looks like a newspaper that actually is, is a propaganda sheet. It's perfectly legal to do that, but, but it is, it is you know, a, a little bit repellent not to tell people what it actually is, to try to fool them. Uh, and that's the difference. And that's the thing, that's, that's where you know, responsible media, balanced media should come in and just say, hey, look, you know, this isn't illegal, it's not like sinister, but it's, but it's wrong at some level. And that's what we need to, you know, that's what we need to call out, so. Amen to that. Except I would argue and hope that perhaps I've proven here a little bit that it is sometimes illegal and it is extremely, extremely sinister. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for listening to the second part of our double header on the uh, policy circle. Wilmette's own contribution to the dismantling of representative democracy. Uh, we hope you enjoy this podcast. We hope you'll start a conversation with us. We all need to get together, see what's going on. So please check out our website. Again, we're going to put up all of the stuff we talked about here. We're going to have a policy circle resources page. So if you're uh, in the media, you're a journalist, I encourage you to check it out, write about it, let people know. If you're a concerned citizen, you can see it too. It'll boggle your mind. And um, yeah, I just appreciate your time. Uh, this is a project that's, I think, really important. Um, it's also really important that we point out that this is not left versus right or uh, blue versus red. Uh, this is about all of us, all Americans, standing up against this tiny, tiny cabal of billionaires who have taken over our democracy and saying, you know what? Enough. We are for representative democracy. We are for uh, we the people, and we the people are going to make some changes. So, Hope you'll join me in that. Hope you'll join us for our next episode. Hope you'll follow us on Twitter and on Facebook uh, or send an email to info at the long con pod. But most of all, I hope you will stay healthy and well. And um, God bless. Yeah, thanks everybody. Really appreciate it.